Lord Jesus, there are no words to express our thanks for what you've done for us, that you took our place, all that you went through to set us free, to bring us back to the Father like a bridegroom bringing his bride home. We're overwhelmed, Lord, with your grace and your mercy and your love. We'll never get to the end of discovering the wonder of it all until we see you face to face, Lord Jesus. Amen. That day when we're able to sit down with you and you will eat with us and we will eat with you. I let every hindrance, everything that has got in the way will be removed and we will see you as you truly are right now. The King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the God of glory, who is coming again. So this afternoon, Lord, we thank you for the cost. Take us deeper, take us further into the truth. Unveil to us more depths of what the cross means and what it has done. That you might be able to shine out, shine out through us more and more powerfully into the darkness of the world around us. So thank you, Lord Jesus. We bless you and we praise you. This is to glorify you, Lord because you are worthy of all the glory and the honour and praise. Amen. Amen. So this is the last session, number seven, living in the light of the cross. Um, probably should act more accurately say the light of the cross and the resurrection. And, and in a sense, what I'm trying to do is connect up the dots of all the previous six sessions today. And we're talking about living in the victory side of the cross and the resurrection. And it's a very good question to ask ourselves. Where am I living in the terms of the Bible? Am I living in the Old Testament where I'm trying to get right with God and stay right with God by keeping rules and, and following laws and rituals and traditions, which never works? Or perhaps I'm living in the Gospels that... For me, Jesus is this great teacher and he's told us how we should live and, and I'm trying to do everything he said. I'm trying to love my enemies and, and forgive you know, 490 times and all of those things and I can't do it because it's before the cross. Or am I living that window between the cross, the resurrection and Pentecost where I know I'm saved I know I'm going to heaven, but I'm not seeing the power of God at work in my life and through me. Or am I living in Pentecost? And I, it's the, the truth, the victory of the cross and the resurrection, but now the power of the Holy Spirit living in me and through me to realise the resurrection life that Jesus came to give us all. Where we live is important, and we can live in lots of different places in the Bible, but God intends us to live in the power of Pentecost, in the light of the cross and the resurrection, seeing his victory pouring out through our lives. I said a lot there, which <laughs> it's probably started a lot of hairs running, but anyway, we're going to uh, get into this. I, I want to start with... Um, Galatians 2, verse 20. And for me, this verse, I, I've pondered this verse for years. And for me, it's one of Paul's most profound verses in his teachings. And this is what he said in Galatians 2, verse 20. I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live. But Christ lives in me. 
The life I live in my body, in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. When you start to meditate on this, you realise that Paul sees his old nature, his old man crucified with Christ on the cross. He sees it. He sees his old man on the cross, crucified. When Christ died, he died. And and in Romans 6, he says, if we have been crucified with him, we will also be resurrected with him. So Paul's had this revelation. In a sense, Paul, he was Saul before he got saved. So Saul died Paul lived. It's a new life. And the spiritual reality that Paul has now has a Christ life. It's not just a new life on his own. It's a life together with Christ, in Christ, clothed in Christ, lost in him. And Jesus is living in Paul by the Holy Spirit. And that's what happens when we get saved. The Holy Spirit comes into our lives and the Holy Spirit is identical to Jesus in every way. He said, I'm sending you another just like me. So the Holy Spirit is identical in every way in what he wants, what he does and how he works. And because Jesus came not to give us a better life, not to give us improvement. He came to kill off the old life so that we could have a brand new life in him. The gospel is radical and that it doesn't, the Christian gospel, it doesn't teach people to have a better life. It teaches people that your old man should die so that you could have a brand new life. United with Christ. And What Paul understands, of course, is that he's entered into the most intimate relationship with Christ. Intimate in the sense that he's now in oneness with Christ, which is exactly what Jesus prays for. And not just for Paul, but for all of us. In his prayer in John 17, his his prayer is that we would be in him and he in us. That was Jesus' prayer, his desire. And that's what is made possible when we are born again, when we are saved, one with Christ. And this issue of you see yourself crucified with Christ, we need a spiritual revelation to see ourselves, like Paul did, on that cross 2,000 years ago. When Christ died, I died. We need the Holy Spirit to give us spiritual eyes to take that in. Because it's fundamental. And that is the true reality of Christian life. That's what how the kingdom of heaven works. And it's not the way the world works. The spiritual reality of heaven is different from the way of the world. Everything that we see around us is temporal, it's temporary. All of this will disappear, it will go. But the kingdom of heaven is eternal. And that's where we've been taken to spiritually. And eventually, when we get our new resurrection body, we will be there physically. But spiritually, we're already there. That's our spiritual position. That's why it says in Ephesians 2, it says we are seated in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. We need the Holy Spirit to give us this sort of revelation because it is totally opposite to the way the world ticks and the way we've been brought up. We need a spiritual revelation, and he will give it to us. So let's just move on now to Romans 8, verses 1 and 2. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, because through Christ Jesus, the law of the spirit of life set me 
free from the law of sin and death. The gospel message is a message of liberation. Now, I guess a lot of the world thinks that you know, God just wants to dictate to us, you know, stop doing that, you must do this. But that's not the gospel. The gospel message is a message of liberation. It's a liberation from sin and death, which is the penalty of sin. Romans chapter 1 through 7 is the Christian doctrine that Paul lays out for us. And and we feast on it, and we've been feasting on it ever since he wrote it and sent it out. And we'll never get to the end of it this side of heaven. There is such a wealth of spiritual truth in Romans chapters 1 through 7. And it's man's problem, God's answer, which is the cross. And then Romans 8 is God's plan for all believers. That's why it says, therefore, so Paul is saying, because of chapters 1 through 7, except he didn't have chapters, except through chapters 1 through, because of all I've told you, therefore, there is no condemnation. It's a gateway verse to enter the life, the spirit-filled, led, empowered life, that God intends for every believer. Not just a, a special few, but for every believer. This is the destination that God wants. It's a life filled with the Holy Spirit, led by the Holy Spirit, empowered by the Holy Spirit, so he can work in us and he can work through us. And that's what we've been set free into. We're freed to to live a Holy Spirit life. A Holy Spirit-powered life. And and the key word here is freedom. I'm going to go back to some words of uh, Jesus. And he's talking to... uh, the Jews, in John 8, uh, John 8, verse 31. And when Jesus is talking to the Jews, he's talking to the people who've got the law of Moses mindset. For them, it's all about keeping the law of Moses. That's their identity. That's what the Jews are all about. That's what Israel stands for. And then Jesus comes along and tells them, well, actually, I'm bringing all that to a conclusion now. I'm going to fulfill all of that because there's a new time coming. There's the age of grace is coming. And this is what Jesus says. To the Jews who had believed him, Jesus said, if you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. Then, of course, they're going, "Uh, what? They answered him, we are Abraham's descendants and have never been slaves of anyone. Uh, They must have forgotten what happened in Egypt. How can you say that we shall be set free? Jesus replied, I tell you the truth. Everyone who sins is a slave to sin. Now, a slave has no permanent place in the family, but a son belongs to to it forever. So if the son sets you free... You will be free indeed. So the message, the key word is freedom. The gospel message is a message of freedom. Free from slavery to sin, following its impulses and its demands. That's, that's, That's what you do before you're saved. Freedom to be who God made you to be. And that and that's huge. Because I always think, for a lot of the young people today who are being told, you're this, you're that, you know, all that, that gender stuff, you know, that, that's, that's the devil doing all of that. The, 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 the answer they need is they need to know that through salvation they will be free to be who God made them to be. They will be redeemed, reborn, renewed, recreated. Then they will find out who they are. And they won't be told what they are by people who, don't, who do want nothing more than to destroy their lives and put them in bondage, basically. And we're freed from keeping laws and rules to be right with God. And, and we can compare the freedom that the world has. The, the freedom the world has or wants 
It's a freedom to do whatever you want without there being any consequence. And that's what you see happening all the time. It's not my fault. It's because he did this to me. I want to be free to do this. I don't want any consequences. But while this is freedom for us, we also need to remember it's free to us. But think about the cost that Jesus paid to give us that freedom. It's free to us but it cost him everything. The highest price there has ever been, the blood of the Son of God. There's no greater price than that. So let's move on. Let's talk about getting free from the past. So freedom from condemnation. Let's go to John 3, verse 17. Now, we all know John 3.16, but 17 and 18 are just as important. Verse 17. And this is Jesus speaking to Nicodemus. These are, this is Jesus' own words. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because he has not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. See, we were already condemned before we believed in Jesus. Now, a lot of people don't see it like that. They think, I'm only condemned when I'm found out for doing something bad. And they don't realise we start off from a place of condemnation. And Jesus came to get us out of condemnation into acceptance and freedom. And the issue is believing in Jesus. Now, I want to point out something that I don't think this is always, always preached, but when Jesus was explaining to the disciples about the Holy Spirit coming, in John 16, he says, now, when he comes, this is what he's going to do. I've got to go away so that the Holy Spirit, the counsellor, can come. And in verse 16, verse 8, he says, When he, that's the Holy Spirit, comes, he will convict the world of guilt in regard to sin and righteousness and judgment. In regard to sin, because men do not believe in me. See, the issue is, it's believing in Jesus. And notice it says sin, singular. The Holy Spirit doesn't go around the world saying, You lied. You stole. The Holy Spirit goes around saying, you need a new life. You need to believe in the Saviour. That's what the Holy Spirit does. And that's different from what a lot of people think. See, the Holy Spirit doesn't go around picking on specific sins. We've got a conscience to do that. We've got a conscience that all of mankind has got a conscience. As soon as Adam and Eve ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, they lost their innocence and they had a conscience. They now knew what was right and what was wrong. <laughs> and that is in everybody. And it's true that when people basically suppress it and, and basically go so far as to as really deny it, that they can end up searing their conscience so they can no longer tell the difference between right and wrong. And you can see that happening around the world, particularly with dictators who convince themselves they're doing the right thing. See, Jesus came to save, not condemn. And that should inform how we preach the gospel. We're holding out the offer of eternal life, forgiveness of sins. We're not saying, you need to get right with God, otherwise you're heading for judgment. That's not good news. That's bad news. That's where we all were. But we hold out the offer of life and forgiveness and being reconciled with God, of being moved from the kingdom of this world into the kingdom of heaven. That's the good news that we hold out to people. Jesus came to liberate us from condemnation and the penalty of death. And... In a sense, the purpose of all of this cross-teaching is to give us a confidence in our faith. And 
I just wanted to point out one verse that uh, John wrote in 1 John. Just one verse. I'll, I'll read it out to you. You don't need to, to turn to it. He says, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of, Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life. And that's the purpose of these, these teachings on the cross. That we may know that we have eternal life, that we may know we are right with God, that we may know that the Holy Spirit is leading us day by day, that we may know it in our, some people say, in our knower. Not just a, a mental ascent, but no, I know this. You can tell me anything you, you like, you can do anything you want, you can try and argue me out of it, but I know, but I know, but I know. Because this is the truth. This is the truth. I'm going to turn now to, we, we've been here before, but it's, there's something to see in this. It's in the book of Zechariah, in the Old Testament, in Zechariah 3. And it's a picture. It's an Old Testament picture of what the cross does. And it's Zechariah 3, and it's verse 1 to 4. Then he showed me Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord. Now, later I'll show you. The angel of the Lord here, I believe, is an Old Testament appearance of Jesus. And Satan, standing at his right side to accuse him. The Lord said to Satan, the Lord rebuke you, Satan. The Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. Is not this man a burning stick snatched from the fire? Now Joshua was dressed in filthy clothes as he stood before the angel. The angel said to those who were standing before him, take off his filthy clothes. Then he said to Joshua, see, I have taken away your sin and I will put rich garments on, on you. That angel says, I have taken away your sin. Only Jesus can take away our sin. So I believe this is an Old Testament appearance of Jesus. It's an illustration of the judicial dimension, for to use the phrase, of God's righteous act of the cross. It's perfect justice. Justice demands that sin be punished. And that's, that's what Satan says. You can't let sin go unpunished. That's, that's the judicial side of it. So God says, okay, I will carry out the punishment, but he carries it out on his own son so that we're spared, we go free. Satan has got grounds to accuse us before God because of, and here it's pictured, filthy clothes. That's a picture of our sinfulness. Justice demands judgment. But you notice it's the Lord rebukes Satan. God does it. God saves us. Rich garments, and we can think of what Isaiah said, robes of righteousness. We are clothed with robes of righteousness. A perfect righteousness, the perfect righteousness of Christ is credited to us like a robe so that we are perfectly accepted by God the Father, and we're counted as perfectly righteous with his righteousness. Hallelujah. And again, it's God who does it, not us. See, the truth is, God gives, we receive. A lot of people think God's only in the business of taking. That's wrong. God gives, we simply receive. And that's the grace. Let's talk about freed into our future. So freedom from guilt. And uh, let's go to Hebrews 10. And I'm going to start in verse 19. <coughs> See, we are saved from something into something. We're saved from a past into a new future. So salvation isn't just getting your sins blotted out and then you go to heaven. It's no, God's purpose is to save us out of something to get us into something. 
Hebrews 10, verse 19. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way opened for us through the curtain, that is his body, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. So even when we're unfaithful, he is faithful. Before, we couldn't get into the presence of God. We couldn't get into the Holy of Holies. We couldn't live in God's immediate presence. But now the blood of Jesus has made that possible. We live there. That's our spiritual home. It's not like the Old Testament where a picture where the high priest goes into the Holy of Holies once a year after on the Day of Atonement after a lot of sacrificing first for his own sins and then for the sins of the people. No, now that curtain has been ripped open. Now that is our home. That's where we live. We live in the presence of God. That's why we don't need to say at the end of a service, Lord, go with us. He's always with us. Jesus said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. And he meant it. The blood of Jesus has made this possible and we have confidence, we have full assurance, that's where we live. And the other thing, guilt is removed. It says, our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience. Satan's favourite weapon against Christians, believers, is to make us feel guilty, to destroy our confidence before God. That we, won't, we don't feel like we can approach God because I've done this. And it's based on a lie. But here, no guilty conscience. A con- we don't have a conscience that accuses us. Because I'm going to go, get into this in a minute. Because I want to explode something that I think has been a problem for a lot of people. See, when you believe in Jesus and you understand the power of the blood that's paid for past sins, present sins and future sins, you can live with a confidence before God, even when we mess up and we sin. It's not like we're saved one minute and then we've lost it the next minute because we've done something wrong. We're saved because we continue to believe that Jesus is our saviour. He died on a cross for us. And and this is the verse that I want to go for. And it's 1 John 1, 9. And you you will have heard this verse. It's, It's actually, it's been incorporated into liturgy. And it's the verse that says, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. So the inference is that if you don't confess your sins, he won't forgive you. But, you know, this has been taken out of context and it's been misused. Because it locks Christians into a merry-go-round of confessing sins. Because then you say, have I confessed enough? Have I, have, I, have I done everything? Is there something that I've done that I don't know about, that God is holding against me, that I, I, I better confess? And you think, I'm going to try and confess everything. And do you know, that's exactly where Martin Luther was before the Reformation. In that syst- le- <laughs> legalistic religious system at the time, it was all based on confession. And Martin Luther would keep confessing and keep confessing, but he never got that sense of peace with God. Because you can't, through just simply confessing. And then he got the revelation. He was shown that the righteous will live by faith. 
And he realised that it wasn't dependent on him confessing his sins, it was dependent on Jesus dying on a cross. Faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And the problem with this chapter, 1 John chapter 1, is people don't understand who it was written to or what it was written about. It's actually written to challenge heresies that were creeping into the church at that time. And the first heresy was a holy God could possibly inhabit sinful human being. And that's why, if you've got one John in front of you, that's why John says, we have seen with our eyes, we have looked at, and our hands have touched. He said, we lived with Jesus. We know he was a human being. We lived with him, we ate with him, we touched him. He was a real human being. So that's one heresy. The second heresy was, is probably what they call Gnosticism, which is that it's only about what you know. As long as you know the truth, it doesn't matter what you do. And that's why it goes on in verse 5. We have, this is the message we've heard from him and declare to you, God is light, in him there is no darkness. If we claim to have fellowship with him, yet walk in darkness, we lie and do not live by the truth. If we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. These were people who were saying, oh, well, I know about all that, but it doesn't matter what I do, because it's just a, a matter of knowing. So that was the second heresy. And then the third heresy is, that leads into 1 John 1, 9 is that this idea that, well, we haven't got sin. I'm a good guy. I'm a good person. He, he's, he's got sin, he, he, he needs to confess his sins, but, you know, I'm a good person. So John says, if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not on, in us. And then he goes on 1 John 1, 9. If we claim, verse 10, we have claimed we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar and his word has no place in our lives. Talking about the born-again moment, talking about people who think they're good enough that they don't need anybody to... Make them righteous. So three heresies, that's what this first chapter... Because notice, when you get into chapter two, and, and sometimes it's a bit unfortunate that they have chapter breaks, because they weren't in the original, because he starts off, my dear children, different audience. Mm -hmm. Now he's talking to a different audience. So what is our confession of sin? Because we do sin. Christians sin. Well, see what John says. My dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin. Yeah, that's, we, we don't want to sin. But listen, he's being realistic. But if anyone does sin, we have one who speaks to the Father in our defence, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins. And not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world world. See, that's our confession. When we do sin, and we're thought, Lord, I should not have done that. I'm sorry, Lord, but thank you. Thank you for the blood. Thank you for the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ that still makes me righteous in your sight. That is our confession. Not, oh, I'm a miserable sinner, I've done it again, I'm sorry. I remember... It's probably only a couple of years ago now. Uh, a lady came to speak to me after I'd spoken at a, at a church. She was caught up in this tumble dryer of confessing sins. She said, I keep confessing my sins, but I just can't get free. And, and it's got to the point where I can't even go out the house because I'm caught the time of just confessing and confessing and confessing. And so I, I had to walk her through. I said... And it was because of 1 John 1, 9. I said, but you have to understand the context of this verse. It is not there to condemn you. It was a challenge to people who said they've got no sin. So hopefully I've nuked that one. Um, and, I'm gonna, and this is another little interesting one. In Romans 7, Romans chapter 1, Romans chapter 1, 
The first part of verse 7. To all in Rome who are loved by God and called to be saints. Uh, when we lived in Essex, Heather uh, went and joined in with a, uh, a course. Was it, it was an Anglican church, was it? It, it, was a, it was a course called Called to be Saints. And, of course, it was all about what we've got to do to be a saint. And, and throughout history, we know certain people, they've decided the saints, and cert certain people, you know, no, I'm sorry, you haven't quite made it. And it's a total misunderstanding. See, the word saint, it simply means sanctified. And we are sanctified by the blood of Jesus when we believe in him. It, interestingly, if you, the New American Standard Version, which is a very accurate version, actually translate that as called as saints. And that puts it in a different light. You see, you may, not, you may not appreciate this, but if you believe in Jesus and you've been sanctified by his blood, you are a saint. Yes. Right. Now, we don't go around everyone and say, well, I, I'm St. Christopher, and I you know, <laughs> don't do that. I mean, people will get fed up with that for a start. But, but that's, that's from God's perspective. That's you are sanctified by the blood of Jesus. No other way. And just to, just to heap something else on top of that, in Hebrews 13, we, we, I remember when we were back in Essex, we, we had a, a conversation in the little church we were in, and um, we, we, were, we were sort of saying, well, because you know you are a saint. Oh, no, I'm not a saint. And she was a believer. She was born again. No, no question. But she could not accept the fact that God would see her as a saint, sanctified by the blood of Jesus. Because of all the, the rubbish that has been spread around with this idea, what is a saint? It's all been blurred. Anyway, this, this is, I'll just throw this one as, in as well. This is from Hebrews 13, verse 12. And so Jesus also suffered outside the city gate to make the people holy through his own blood. You're a saint, and God says you're holy. <laughs> Even when we feel far from holy, God says, the blood speaks. I count you as holy. In other words, you're, you're mine, you belong to me, you're separated to me. Now, in practical terms, we may be far from it in terms of our performance, but in positional terms, we're holy. We're accepted. We're righteous. And once we start to get our head right, it's not to make us big-headed or, you know, super spiritual. It's to get us free from the accusations and the garbage of the world to enter fully into the fullness of life, the freedom of life that Jesus wants to ha us to have. So let's talk about freedom from fear, because fear is a powerful weapon, and the enemy uses it as much as he can to frighten us into inactivity. Romans 8, verse 31. Just a short verse. What then shall we say in response to this? If God is for us, who can be against us? What a simple statement. In other words, because of Romans 1 right through to 8 verse 30, we can say that God is for us. Wow. Almighty God is on our side. The battle against Satan is his battle. We're in his army 
And he is the commander-in-chief. It's not our battle, it's his battle. We're involved in it, but it's his battle. And he loves us. He loves us with a love that is beyond measure. Because if you go down a bit further down, verse 38. And this is Paul writing. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Hallelujah. Nothing will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. Nothing. There is nothing that can separate us from God's love. That's in Christ. If we're in Christ Jesus, it's inseparable. Yeah. Yes. Freedom from fear. And then we can go back to 1 John 4 now. And this is, a, this is another passage that people will be familiar with. 1 John 4, verse 18. But it brings out an important truth. 1 John 4, 18. There is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear. That's God's love. Because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. The true understanding of God's love for us drives out fear. If God is for us, God loves us, and God has already punished our sins in his Son, there is, there is no fear left. No fear of God left. There's reverence, respect, all worship, all of that, but there's no fear of punishment anymore. Because when you believe in the Lord Jesus as your Lord and Saviour, you're born again, judgment of sin and death is behind us. Yes. It's gone. It's behind us. We will end our physical life, but then we will go to be in glory. In fact, I won't get into it, but we won't actually see death, the spirit of death. See, the... The, it's not an issue of feelings, and this is where we get, get caught out. It's an issue of standing on the truth of God. There'll be days when we don't feel like it's true, that God loves us, that we're not fearful. There'll be days when it doesn't feel we're in that place. But God's word stands, and it doesn't change with feelings. No fear, because there's no punishment for us, because the punishment was carried out on Jesus at the cross. And God is not going to punish us again. That would be double jeopardy. If he's already punished our sins in Jesus on the cross, he doesn't have grounds. It would be unjust if he punishes us all over again for sins. Right. Freedom to be overcomers, more than survivors. And the enemy certainly doesn't want us to understand this. He might allow us to survive, but he doesn't want us to be an overcomer. Revelation 12, verse 10 and 11. Then I heard a loud voice in heaven say. Now, I always say when it says a loud voice, it means it's like a cosmic declaration. It's not just like, you know, me speaking to you here. This is said so the whole universe, the cosmos, will hear this declaration. Now have come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God, the authority of his Christ, for the accuser of our brothers who accuses them before our God day and night, has been hurled down. They overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. They did not life, love their lives so much as to shrink from death. The power of the cross, the blood of Jesus, 
released in our lives through faith in him as our saviour. And it makes us overcomers of the kingdom of darkness for ourselves, but actually also for others' sake. When God does something for us, he's got something in mind for others as well because he wants to work in us and through us. So when God does something in us, he'll have in mind something he wants to do through us for somebody else. And the testimony is, faith in Jesus and the work of the cross, that makes us righteous, that silences the accuser. He has got no grounds to accuse us when we talk about the blood of the Lamb. We trust in the blood of the Lamb. All the grounds of his accusation are gone. It silences him. And the hallmark of overcomers is an abandonment to God. We abandon ourselves to him. No fear of death. But nobody looks forward to the end of life. But there's no fear of death. We're abandoned to God. He marks our beginning and our end of days. And when we're finished here, we will be translated into glory. That's where we will be. We go back to Romans 8, again, verse 37. I know what I, I dash about a bit. But I want to get as much out as I can. And this is what Paul says, 8 verse 37. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. That's an extravagant statement from Paul when you read what he went through. All the troubles he had, the shipwrecks, the beatings, the imprisonment. And he says, no, we're more than conquerors. That's amazing. And, but also notice, Paul says, we, not I, we. Again, it's, it's about our position. I, I'm convinced, maybe this is just a personal thing, but a lot of our sort of hang-ups come from not understanding between the difference between our position and our performance. That when we believe our position is set with God, our performance will vary from day to day. I, and, and I always use this illustration. My last job before I retired, don't like that word either, Last job was in a school as a, as a technician in the uh, design and technology department. Now, that was my title, that was my position. And I used to get a wage slip and said it on it. I'm the technician. <laughs> I've, look, I've got, a, I've got a, a, a blue coat that says so. Now, that was my position. Now, if I did a good job, I was a technician. If I did a, a, a duff job one day, I was still the technician. My position didn't change. My performance did. And I'm convinced that for a lot of us, once we get the position set in our heads, it will get rid of a lot of our hang-ups and actually we will also accidentally start to perform yeah. <laughs> better. Where was I? Yeah, more than conquerors, i.e. not just survivors. But there's an important point to make here from Hebrews, though, because we all go through tough times. We all get things happen in our lives that we wish they hadn't. They're difficult and they're hard. But in Hebrews 10, back to Hebrews 10, start in verse 23... Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. 
And let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds. Let us not give up meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing, but let us encourage one another, and all the more, as you see the day approaching. Well, when that was written, that was 2,000 years ago, the day is, is approaching more, more and more. And it highlights the need for each other, particularly when times are tough. We can support each other, encourage each other, help each other. When one falls, can lift them up. Because we have an enemy who loves to split somebody off, get them alone, and when they're alone and they start to hear accusations all the rest of it, then it can become really hard and difficult. And it just reminds me, as I say that, about Jesus leaving the 99 and going to find the one lost sheep. Right, what is our freedom for? We've talked about all this wonderful freedom. So how does it all work? <coughs> Would you like to go to Galatians 5? And this is verse 13. <clears throat> you, my brothers, were called to be free. But do not use your freedom to indulge the sinful nature or the flesh, you know, the old life, the old things. Rather, serve one another in love. The entire law is summed up in a single command. Love your neighbour as yourself. We are freed to love others with the love of God. God supplies that love to go in us and through us. God loves through us. It's not a worked up human love. It's God's love, and that's, it's agape love here, is working in us and through us. I, I'm reminded of a lady called Jackie Pullinger. I'm sure you've probably, many of you have heard of her. Back in the 1960s, she got a call. God led her to Hong Kong, and she went to what was called the Walled City, which was basically a lawless part of Hong Kong, full of drug addicts, controlled by the triad. And she was called to go, and she went in to preach the gospel and to save drug addicts. And in her book, Chasing the Dragon, she writes how, and of course when she went, she was not welcomed with open arms. She had a lot of opposition. People did a lot of things to try and drive her out. And she, and she honestly writes in her book, she said one day, she said, I can't love these people. And God said to her, but I can love them through you. And that was the key that opened it all up. God was able to love through Jackie and many drug addicts got saved, got delivered. The world city doesn't exist anymore. That all got knocked down. But that was God loving through a person. And Jackie Pullinger isn't, she would say, she's not anybody special. It's God's way for all of us. We all struggle to love some people. Some people just rub us up the wrong way. But God loves them. Yeah. And when we just say, look, I can't do this, you'll have to do it. And God says, that's okay, I can, I will. Allow me to just flow through you. And we're also freed from the influence and control of the sinful nature, the what I want. Because the truth is, we were bought at a price, we're not our own anymore. We belong to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. But he's, he's a wonderful owner. He's a loving owner. And he doesn't, he's not here to spoil our joy. He's here to lead us in the fullness of life. And the more we love, the freer we are. The world doesn't think like this, it thinks the other way around. 
the, the more we give away, the more we get. What, whatever it is, whether it's love, it, even, even material things. Because God, as God pours in and as we release, he pours more back in. And he's got an inexhaustible supply. And it's all grace. No one deserves it. It's freely given because it's all been paid for by the King of Kings. Right, 2 Corinthians 2 verse 14. Now Heather, we, Heather and I, we say this every morning. It's really sort of remind ourselves, really. <laughs> but, um, but it's a good proclamation because I believe in proclamation, because, and this will come up in a moment, when you proclaim things, you're not the only person listening. 2 Corinthians 2.14 But thanks be to God, who always leads us in triumphal procession in Christ, and through us spreads everywhere the fragrance of the knowledge of him. A triumphal procession is the celebration of a victory that's already been won. So as we trudge along in this procession, in this fallen world, if on one day our head's down because it's just so hard going, you're still in the triumphal procession. And the next day when your head is up because everything's starting to click today, you're still in the same triumphal procession. It's a celebration of a victory that Jesus has already won. And it also tells us that our lives, not just what we say, are the fragrance of Jesus. We smell to the world around us in the nicest possible way, you understand. It's unconscious evangelism. People read us. It it's not, that, that's why it does matter what we do. People read us. They read our reactions. They see how we respond. And a lot of people recognise there's something different about you because, because of what that person said. If he said that to me, I'd have thumped him. But you smiled. How come? People are reading us all the time. And we don't know it. In fact, Mark and I were sort of talking something about this. About, it's about when you're in a workplace and there's a lot of bad language going on. I was a postman um, for seven years and in this little sorting office in Essex. And, um, you know, rough and ready guys. You know, they're, they're all a good bunch of guys. I liked them. Um, and they, we were all in these sort of rows of, of sorting areas and you couldn't see the people around the other side of it and they'd be sort of, and one day I, I, I remember I'd finished sorting and, and I was walking around to get something and the person on the other side as I walked past he, he started saying a lot of swear words and then he saw me he said oh I'm sorry I didn't see you there I never said don't swear in my presence now, I'm not saying I, I then led him to the Lord and he got saved and, and all the rest of it, but it's just that simple thing. People notice how we tick. Yeah. And also, this reveals that the key calling in our life is to make Jesus known. Yeah. That's what the world needs. It needs to be Jesus. Yeah. I mean, quite often... I mean, particularly around about now with Ramadan, open doors, ask people to pray that these Muslims will have a vision, a dream of Jesus as he really is. That they would meet Jesus. And they do. Imams embedded in some of the deepest Muslim countries that have never heard the gospel preached there are stories of imams coming to believe in Jesus as their Lord and Saviour. Because they met Jesus. The Holy Spirit anoints our lives. He does the convicting, working through us. Our part 
is just to surrender ourselves, abandon ourselves to him. He knows what he wants to do for each and every one of us, and it's different for each and every one. The, like, like, here I am. Here I am, Lord, use me. That's probably one of the most da- dangerous prayers that we can pray, but it's probably also one of the best prayers that we can pray. Here I am, Lord, use me how you want. Oh, I didn't think you are going to ask me to do that, but, but it will always be the best. Now, it, here's picking up on what I said a moment ago about when we make a proclamation. It's, it's not only us are listening. In, in Ephesians 3... Uh, verse 10. This is God's, this is talking about God. Verse 10. His intent was that now, through the church, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms, according to his eternal purposes, which he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. Our witness is not just to the world, but it's also to the spiritual powers and authorities. They're they're looking at all of this, and the demonic forces hate it when we lift up Jesus and we declare the blood of Jesus and the cross of Jesus. They hate it because it's their defeat. We are part of his eternal work of redemption. And, and I want to point out something that that's in Hebrews. Now, we're all familiar with Hebrews chapter 11, the heroes of faith chapter it's sometimes called. And the, But the last two verses of Hebrews 11, verse 39 and 40, and this is talking about all of these great heroes of faith, all their great exploits, these were all commended for their faith, yet none of them received what had been promised. God had planned something better for us so that only together with us would they be made perfect. See, they lived before the cross. We live after the cross. We... We are part of that eternal work of redemption, not just for ourselves, but for all the heroes of faith. And I wonder if you carry on into into chapter twelve. And again, this is a shame that this this breaking up into the chapter kind of loses the sense of what it's saying here. Therefore, so because of that. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. The picture it's painting there is these heroes of faith, all the people who've gone before, they're leaning over the balcony of heaven and they're saying, Go on! Yes! Keep going! Yes! Stand! Don't let them do that! Keep going! Proclaim the truth! Because they're depending on us as well for it to be brought to completion. I love that picture. That they're cheering us on. And how like God to use will announce his redemption victory through man that the devil had tied up and plunged into sin. That God used us against the enemy. How like God to do that? You think you've defeated me, Satan? Then look at my children. They're going to tell you your end. (laughs) Hallelujah. So what is the right response to the cross? Should we go to Romans 12? You're probably ahead of me here, but... Romans 12, verse 1 and 2. Mm -hmm. 
Therefore, another therefore, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship, or it's your uh, reasonable act of worship. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing and perfect will. See, true worship is the surrender of our lives. It's, the singing is just part of it. It's the surrender of our whole lives to him. We belong to him. And we say, okay, Lord, you paid for me. Here I am. Help me just lay it all down. I'm not saying it's, it's, it's simple, but help me just lay it all down and follow you wherever you want me to go. And what happens, it releases this progression. We no longer live like the world does. We tick differently. We have a renewed mind, and the mind is the battlefield. And it emphasises the importance of the word, that we need to know what the word says to know what the truth is. And ultimately then that leads to we know God's will and his will is good, it is pleasing, and it is perfect. Yes. When you find God's will for your life, it's good, it's pleasing, it's perfect. There's no other plan for your life than the one God has for you. Because he's a good God. Uh, right, we're... we're we're coming to a, a close, but we'll go back to Romans 8, verse 12. Therefore, brothers, we have an obligation, but it's not to the sinful nature, the old life, to live according to it. For if you live according to the sinful nature, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live, because those who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive a spirit that makes you a slave again to fear, but you received the spirit of sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now if we are children then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, if indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we also might share in his glory. And we talked about this sort of last time. We are free to live as sons of God, sons with an inheritance, a co-heir with Christ. All that Christ has, he shares with us. That, that's awesome. Freed into this shared inheritance, and knowing that we can call Almighty God, Creator God, Abba, which is a personal and intimate word. It's a word of closeness. We're freed from fear. Now, in this life, we will face trouble. We will suffer persecution. We will experience sufferings because we have an enemy. We have opposition. But... We are headed for glory. And that's why Paul goes on to say in verse 18, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. See, I think Paul had a revelation of the glory that allowed him to say something like that. To, to, so that the troubles that he went through in this life didn't so overwhelm him as to beat him down and destroy his faith. I believe he had a revelation of what waits us in, for us in the glory. And that we're all headed there. Because there's no hierarchy in glory. There's only one hierarchy, and that's the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit seated on the throne. So how do we wrap all this up? Living in the light of the cross is not waiting 
for God to do something. It's living in the power of what he has already done through his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Living a resurrection life, a spirit-filled, empowered life. And I'm going to close with this last, last verses, and this is Jesus speaking, and it's John 7, and it's verse 37. And Jesus said this at the time of the Feast of Tabernacles. And at the Feast of Tabernacles, one of the things they did, part of the ritual, was they poured out water as a, a prayer for the rains for the following harvest. So there's this water ritual going on. And, and that explains the context of why Jesus says this. On the last and the greatest day of the feast, Jesus stood and said in a loud voice, If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, streams of living water will flow from within him. And then John adds the explanation. By this he meant the Spirit, whom those who had believed in him were later to receive. Up to that time the Spirit had not been given, since Jesus had not yet been glorified. So Jesus' picture is that as a believer filled with the Holy Spirit, empowered by the Holy Spirit, his intention is that his life flows out through us, the very centre of our, like a river, a river of life. That, that we are, if you like, we, we are like his channels for him to reach a hurting world. And it's for every Believer. Every believer. To make a way for us to join you in heaven in eternity. You paid the price that we could never pay. You did what no man could do. You who wrote the law fulfilled it for us. The highest demands of God's righteous justice. You did that for us. And because you paid the price, you offer us freedom from sin, eternal life, the gift of righteousness for free. Simply by accepting you, receiving you, believing you, and trusting you. And thank you that however imperfectly we do that, you never cast us off. You never deny us before the Father. You hold us in the palm of your hand. Because you came in the Father's love to bring us back to yourself, to be one with you. So we praise you, Lord Jesus. You are the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the Saviour of the world, the coming King. We praise you and thank you, and I pray that all that we've seen, which is just a, a tiny amount of all that the cross did, is, and, and does, and I pray that you will seal that into our lives so that we can shine like lights in the darkness of the world around us, bringing glory to you and blessing to the people around us. So we praise you, Lord Jesus, sent by the Father in the power of the Holy Spirit to be your bride for eternity. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Now, as we close, I just want to say thank you. I want to say thank you, Pastor Joanna and Pastor Jim, for the opportunity the, to be able to do this. 
uh, I want to thank you for everybody who's helped, the tech guys, everybody who's helped in any way with the refreshments, I want to help, because I couldn't do all of this, and I didn't arrange it, but somehow God did it. And, and I just say, and I just say thank you. And last of all, like Heather said, I want to thank you because it's different. It's a different dynamic when there's people there than if you're just looking at a camera. So thank you, everybody. Thank you. Yes. Thank you all.